Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back, and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. The wind is gone I'm from my sails And no one's left Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson, and this week I have another re-release for you, and this is another one that Adam and I did some years ago. Adam, uh, for those of you who are newer, was the original co-host on the show, my my buddy who started it all with me almost seven years ago, and uh, something that we meant to do a while back, we wanted to, because um, we've you know, been around for a while, been doing this for a little bit, uh, wanted to re-release some episodes that were some of our greatest hits or some episodes that we thought that uh, were very enjoyable and useful. And so, uh, as with many (laughs) great ideas that we had, never got around to doing it. So, uh, I'm doing it now because I also didn't want to leave you guys with with no content while I uh, sort out all of the personal stuff in my life. So, um, as most of you guys probably already know, uh, unfortunately, my mom passed away uh, about a month ago. And so um, anytime that sort of thing happens, you know, your life kind of gets a lot of things in your life get put on hold. And so uh, I've, I've been spending this time trying to take care of myself, you know, going to uh, weekly therapy sessions and trying to make sure I'm grieving properly. And, um, and uh, also, you know, taking care of my daughter and being there for her, you know, she's uh, about to turn nine. And um, anyone who's, who's, kind of been through grief with a, uh, with a youngster knows that they process things differently and sometimes they don't know exactly how to process it. And so, um, you know, that's been obviously, a a challenge to, to, to help her process it well and to, uh, to make sure that, you know, we're remembering grandma, um, you know, in a positive way and, and, uh, remembering the good times and, and, uh, we're making a memory box together and, and some things like that. So, been working on stuff like that. So obviously, uh, have not been recording new episodes, um, just now getting back around to it. So I didn't want to leave you guys empty handed. So I figure now is a perfect time to re-release some older episodes. So you're going to hear some stuff, um, related to a host of different topics. And, um, as we get closer to Halloween, uh, probably release, re-release some, some of the Halloween theme type episodes that we did in years past that were pretty fun. Um, but this particular one, was one that I enjoyed a lot. This is a recommendation by Adam, um, Dr. Pauline, Pauline Boss. And uh, she's known as a pioneer in the in- interdisciplinary study, that's really hard to say, of family stress. For over 30 years, her work is focused on connecting family science and sociology with family therapy and psychology. And she's really known for um, this book called Ambiguous Loss. And it's this really interesting uh, field that... Um, she basically pioneered when it comes to loss and grieving specifically for instances where it's not so cut and dry. Um, you know, like instances where, you know, a grandparent or a parent passes away. Um, you know, there's a sense of finality to that. Whereas instances where you're dealing with a loved one who has, for example, Alzheimer's or, you know, somebody who has a loved one who's in the military is a prisoner of war where, there's loss there, but it's not the same. It's kind of this day by day uh, grieving that just continues without that sense of finality. And and so, how do we support our loved ones who are dealing with that sort of thing? And just grief in general. I'm I'm currently working on a, a grief series that I hope to uh, to release part, partly selfishly, but um, 
just in general, society could do a lot better at uh, supporting our loved ones and our community when it comes to grief and grieving. Um, we, we oftentimes, from a selfish perspective, just kind of want people to move on and be like, are you, are you done yet? You know, get over it. And, and it's that's not the way grief works. And grief is a process. And, um, you know, we talk about in this episode, talk a lot about the fact that, um, you know, uh, like, Getting over it is just not something that happens, and um, but you know, grieving and grieving, it's it's a process, and every day, you know, it gets a little easier, and and you feel a little better, you know, but uh, you never really get over that. You never really get over the fact that you can no longer talk to that loved one directly, or or be with them, and and you know, spend time with them, and so you know, this idea that um, that suddenly one day it's it's healed you know, is, is a, uh, it's a misnomer. And so, um, so how do we, how do we more appropriately, more effectively support those who are going through the grieving process? And so hopefully you enjoy this episode. Um, as always, please, uh, subscribe, rate and review the podcast. Please let a friend know if this is, uh, something that's been helpful for you. Um, please pass the word along and uh, share it with a with a friend. Hopefully, you enjoy these re releases. Um, you know, we'll probably do it again in the future. But more new content is coming on the way. Uh, scheduling interviews as we speak and and getting back into the flow of things. Uh, so we will have new content out uh, by the end of the year. So hopefully sooner rather than later. But in the meanwhile, enjoy this re release of Dr. Pauline Boss. Do you- Well, Pauline Boss, we John and I are just uh, we're beaming over here. We're just so excited to to have you on the show. It's such an honor to have you here. So, uh, welcome, formally welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. Thank you for being with us tonight. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, well, for for our listeners out there who aren't as familiar with uh, with your work um, and 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 kind of your background, if you could just give a, a brief kind of high level overview of of who you are, what what you do, and uh, kind of how you got into the work that you, you find yourself in currently. Uh, well, I've been hanging out until I retired in at the University first of Wisconsin in Madison, and then since 1981 at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Family Social Science. Um, I've always been studying ambiguous loss in families um, under the umbrella of family stress. Hmm. <clears throat> and it was a concept I got interested in already as a graduate student when I was in Madison. Uh, so it's been uh, a long time that I've been interested in this concept and, and uh, studying it. I'm also a family therapist, so I've been doing therapy since the 1970s. And one of my uh, therapy teachers in Madison was um, Carl Whitaker, uh, the pioneer, one of the pioneers in family therapy. Wow. Well, uh, my, my family would be pleased to hear this because they're all from, uh, from Wisconsin, so... As, so be, as is mine. Go Badgers, yes. That's right. That's as, right. Is, as is mine. Go Packers, go Badgers. I was born <laughs> in Wausau, lived in Green Bay. Yep. <laughs> uh-huh. There you go. So, so one of the terms that you that you mentioned there, and and I would love for you to take a moment to to define this for our listeners, uh, as this is a, a the main topic that we're going to be discussing throughout the the podcast here is ambiguous loss. How how what is ambiguous loss, and how does that differ from what we would view as regular grief or loss? Uh, ambiguous loss is simply a loss that remains unclear. And without any validation, there is no death certificate, there is no body to bury. Um, And it can be either psychological or physical. A physical ambiguous loss is when the person actually goes missing or is kidnapped or disappears at sea uh, or is somewhere where you don't know where they are. Uh, It could be as catastrophic as the tsunami washing someone away or as common in every day as breaking up with somebody who's no longer with you, but they are somewhere on this earth and um, no longer with you. So that's a physical ambiguous loss. A psychological ambiguous loss is when the mind is missing, such as with the catastrophic illness of Alzheimer's disease 
or one of the 58 other kinds of dementia that affect people now. Uh, it can also be simply from addiction or autism or um, some other ways that the person is there but not there. Mm. So they are physically present but psychologically absent. Um, I might add that ambiguous loss is the most stressful kind of loss there is mm. because there is no certainty about the outcome. Um, so it differs from death. With death, there's a, an official who comes and uh, performs an autopsy or just an examination. There's a death certificate. So there's an official verification of death. And often there is some ritual um, of comfort that other people recognize and acknowledge that you've had a loss. With ambiguous loss, nobody notices because... One thing, there is no death that has occurred, and people don't know how to react to it. Mm. So it's, can you tell us a little bit about um, the evolution of this concept? And, and you know, how did, how, did, how did you start to get interested in this? And, you know, how did, how did this idea start to emerge? Because I think it's so, such a powerful and helpful idea. You know, where did this whole idea come from? Well, it came out of my head. Um, I coined the term in the, in the late 70s. Um, I was a graduate student at Madison, and I was studying theory construction, and, the prof- and I came up with a paper on psychological father absence in an intact family, uh, saying that fathers can be absent even though um, they're physically still in the family. And I was, I was talking about the 1970s when many fathers were working so hard and not at home. It's unlike now. Fathers are much more interactive now. But at that time, um, they weren't. And they would say that the children were mother's business and why should I be here in therapy, family therapy regarding the children? So I wrote that fathers can be present but also absent in families. But my professor in theory construction said, Pauline, it's about more than fathers go home and think about another term that is more broad. And so I did, and I came up with the term ambiguous loss, meaning that anybody in the family could be psychologically absent. An autistic child is psychologically absent. A parent who is on drugs is psychologically absent. Mm. Um, It it might be um, in organizations. It can happen as well if the leader is psychologically absent. So, uh, so it is a more systemic um, uh, effect than I had originally thought. It's, it is indeed about more than fathers. Wow. So there's, there's a concept that came out when we were you know, kind of doing our homework here that I, I thought was so powerful that ties into a little bit of what you're saying. It sounds like um, maybe this is kind of you were making some connections here where the idea came from. Uh, you talk about the paradox of human connections, you know, the the, pres- the presence of an absence or the absence of a presence and the confusion of those things. Can you talk a little bit about that and, uh, and tease out a little bit about what you mean by that? I think that's so, so good and so powerful. Well, I think in human relationships, rarely are we 100% present or absent for, for uh, the people who care about us. Um, mostly we're partly here and partly gone. Like at the moment, uh, I'm not with my family members because I'm on the phone with you. Mm -hmm. So I'm physically present with my husband. We're in the same uh, apartment. But in fact, I'm psychologically preoccupied with with you guys, so I'm not there for him. Um, So I think that's the way human relationships are. Now and then I see somebody who's 100% uh, physically and psychologically present, in a, maybe in a mom and pop um, small uh, business where they're together 24 hours a day, or maybe on a family farm where they were together 24 hours a day. But it's so rare. Hmm. Uh, I think the norm is that um, we have a mixture of absence and presence in our relationships, but we don't often think about that. 
One of the things that to kind of go along with what you're saying that that just struck me is is um, when you talked about psych- being psychologically absent, and I know one of the things that you mentioned in your writing is uh, a whole manner of things that 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 could apply to. And you mentioned computer games and, and video games, and one of the things that I yep. see, at, you know, <laughs> as as technology evolves, is you see you go out to restaurants and you see couples sitting at the same dinner table just staring at their cell phones. And, and, and how yes. ambiguous loss kind of it seems to continue to expand and evolve uh, along with technology. Yes, it, it's changed. It's changed terrifically. Um, you know, um, people have long-term relationships by um, having their Skype picture on the table at a restaurant with them when they are thousands of miles away. Uh, their partner is on, on the table, on the computer. And I'm not saying these are bad. I'm saying these are new. Mm -hmm. The absence and presence paradigm is shifting regarding social media and um, how all that has taken place. In some cases, it has brought people closer. But in other cases, it has separated people. Uh, They're more involved with their uh, devices than they are with the person sitting next to them. So would I be correct in, in making the assumption um, to, you know, use all this terminology that the more that the presence and the absence become things that are confused, is that where the ambiguity increases That w- when you're not distinguishing? Uh, it's, uh, it's the disjoint uh, between the two. Um, however, sometimes people want that, um, for example, long distance relationships and so on. So it might not be pathological, but when there's um, a disparagement between, let's say, with Alzheimer's disease, with the person is present, but you, they no longer know who you are, that tends to create great pain in the people who experience it. Um, or in kids with an addicted parent, um, the person is there, but you know, their head is in a bottle and um, they don't recognize the child anymore. That's very, very painful for the child. And that may be worse than um, a long term, a long term with this kind of um, uncertain loss, unclear loss, ambiguous loss is harder on a person than a clear cut death where they know that the person cannot communicate with them anymore. When the person is there, but not there, there's always a little hope that they'll come back. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Hmm. So one of the, the other phrases that you use, that there's just so much helpful phraseology. You know, I, just, I can't uh, encourage our listeners enough to uh, pick up your works, uh, specifically your book, Ambiguous Loss, and uh, other interviews that you've done. Uh, I, I find this stuff so incredibly helpful uh, living in our day and age where I think this, there's so much of this and we're, we need to get better at talking about it. One of the concepts, the phrases that you use that really struck a chord with me is this uh, phrase, tolerance for the unknown. You say in your book, uh, in order to help others cope with such loss, we must first understand their tolerance for the unknown. I wonder yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Let me take the other side of it first, and that is we live in a mastery-oriented culture one that doesn't tolerate uncertainty and the unknown. Yes. Uh, And those of us who go to school or uh, advanced degrees or uh, technical school, we're we're trained to solve problems. We're trained to fix something. Uh, We are not trained to tolerate um, unanswered questions. And that's what I'm talking about. There are a lot of questions in human relationships that remain unanswered. And... We cannot insist on certainty, on clarity all the time. Mm. Now, I need, to, I need to say a caveat. I want my banker to know that 2 plus 2 is 4 all the time. <laughs> I, I want some certainty in areas of life for yeah. the most part. But now and then with illness or with um, human relationships that um, are not perfect, not 100% together all the time, uh, we need to increase our tolerance for unanswered questions, for not knowing where this person is. Um, I've even talked with some clients who um, the, the parent that was at home called the parent who was at work uh, every hour at work, which is disturbing. 
um, you need to have some trust in the ambiguity of not knowing where the other person is sometimes. Hmm. But it, sometimes it gets overwhelming, like when soldiers are missing in action, when someone is lost at sea. In Japan, where I've been working with the families who lost loved ones that were washed away in the tsunami, um, and after 9-11 in New York, and on and on, um, terrorists today have discovered that uh, kidnapping or disappearing a family member hurts the family longer than killing that family member, so that kidnapping and disappearance is now a major tool of terrorists around the world. Those are terrible things. But in a society such as ours, we need to have more tolerance for the families who are suffering from these kinds of losses. Um, may I give you the example of immigrants and refugees who come here? Um, and in fact, that may be where I came up with the idea. My father was an immigrant from Switzerland mm. um, in 1929, and life was not good here then, so he couldn't get back. So he immigrated by, by default. He didn't intend to stay here. And all of his life, he pined for the people left behind, his mother, his brothers, his sisters, the mountains of Switzerland, and on and on. Um, I've seen this in immigrants today. By the way, my grandmother from Switzerland, my maternal grandmother, wouldn't learn English because she said she'd given up the mountains and, and her homeland and her mother. How many do we see today, older women especially, who won't learn English? I have great empathy for them. Mm. Their, their kids will learn English. <clears throat> they don't need to. <clears throat> the elders don't need to. Hmm. So, so I may have wandered off the topic. Not um, at all. Get me back on it. No, that's perfect. Um, so one of the things, one of the important things uh, I, I found in your book is, <clears throat> excuse me, is the the idea that uh, a lot of people who are on the 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 other end of you know a missing person or or um, uh, someone who's dealing with like Alzheimer's, you know, is, is suffering intensely. And yet, as you say in the book, uh, it's not something that society or their community necessarily recognizes. So how do we go about, uh, first recognizing and then helping that person go through the process of, of grieving? Uh, well, I think the churches can be very helpful here and the communities and, and, uh, uh, any other group that deals with loss and grief have got to include ambiguous loss mm. in their thinking um, because, and some people call it non-finite loss, which is related to that, because people need help with it. They quietly struggle. Caregivers in every country and in ours as well are, are often 24-7 isolated to their house because of needing to be there all the time. Someone in the community needs to relieve them. How many I've heard who say, I'd love to go to church, but I can't leave him. <laughs> and, and then um, I asked one pastor of a congregation, can't you set up a plan whereby somebody would go to their house and sit so this person could come. And the pastor said, we can't do it because of insurance issues. And I thought, oh, my God. Uh. Um, so the community needs to get involved uh, so that people with loved ones who are missing, either in mind or body, are not left to suffer by themselves. They need recognition. And what do we say to them? All we say is, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing to say. Um, we say so many things to people at a funeral that are wrong. Uh, I think with ambiguous loss and with a clear-cut death, the best thing to say is, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Um, one of the concepts that... Um I heard you talk about on your interview with Krista Tippett, which I thought was just a, a splendid interview. Um, and this concept just stuck with me like, oh my gosh, so much of what you're saying is, is making me realize how addicted I am to certainty 
and to always having firm footing and knowing, you know, what the future is going to hold next and things like that. And your concept uh, that you call the myth of closure or that you guys discussed, Uh (laughs) um, I, I was just fascinated by this. I mean, I just realized in that instant how often, um, I believe that I am entitled to closure and that we try, I try to convince others that they're entitled to closure, whether I say it that way or not. Um, I operated for quite some time as a pastor and did a lot of counseling. And I realized uh, listening to that episode was so helpful for me because I can tell you I turned on a dime and started to promise less <laughs> and try to get really? people. Really? Yeah. And I would love to talk really? with you. Yeah. I would love to talk with you a little bit about that. What, when, when we, well, when, it will be my next book. I'm writing the proposal now, The oh. Myth of Closure. Uh, It really bugs me when I hear people on uh, TV and the media say, well, now they've found the dead body. The family has closure. No, they don't. No. Uh, We live with grief. We don't get over it, nor do we need to. Closure is a perfectly good word in real estate when you close a deal or in the business community when you close a deal. what people mean when they say now they find the body, they have closure. Yeah. They don't mean closure. They mean they now have the certainty that he is dead. Yes. Um, and that, so they misuse the term closure, which means close the door. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's misleading to people. It's, I think it's harmful to people. It's cruel to people to let them think there is such a thing as closure. We live with suffering, and indeed it gets less and probably farther and farther apart, what they call oscillation now in the research, as time goes on. But you never 100% close the door on a relationship you once had. You just don't. No. No, I, I found that one of the main things I realized I was doing to people was encouraging them in like, this is my own language, but like almost in a lust for omniscience in situations that, that if you can understand it all, and if you can find more reasons, and if you can get yourself to process things better, that this is going to afford you some kind of bedrock to set, you know, some kind of firm ground that is going to make you feel like you can now take a step forward. And I feel like, like so bad about taking people down that direction for so long. Because when I heard you start to talk about this idea, the myth of closure, it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, what right do I have? (laughs) Or what right do any of us have to think we're ever going to understand this? And that's why a lot of people from cultures other than our own don't believe in therapy. Um, It's because we, we infuse on them um, the beliefs that we have. And I think the yearning for closure grows out of our yearning for mastery, of being in charge, of finding an answer, of getting over the pain. There's something wrong with you if you don't get over the pain. Rather, I take a more Eastern view where you, you learn to live with the pain, manage it perhaps. You don't get over it. Uh, and indeed, what you were saying, it was correct that you need to find some meaning in your loss uh, even in your ambiguous loss, um, which may mean you'll work for the Center for Missing Children if you have a missing child, uh, or some other thing, or you work for a society on autism if your child has autism. But for the most part, um, the, thing, the, the five steps of grief, such as Kubler-Ross, she never meant that for the family. She meant that for the dying person. Hmm. And there is an end point to death when the heart stops breathing, but there is not an end point to grief for someone you cared about. I still use my mother's recipes at every holiday. Hmm. Uh, I use my grandmother's sugar bowl on the table for holiday dinners. I sing some of the songs to my uh, grandchildren that uh, were songs that I heard sung to me or remembered from that. Mm. We don't get over this. Uh, my, my son wears his grandfather's hunting jacket in Colorado. Um, these things are not unusual. Mm. And so I think it's a myth that we find closure. I think we want it, 
we never find it. Mm. And it's okay. And here is the paradox again. The more you search for closure, the more trouble you will have living peacefully with your loss. Oh, I hope that's a quote from the book. <laughs> Either way, oh, it'll be I'll a quote on the podcast. I'll have to get from the transcript. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we'll, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, you need to put that in the book. Yeah. That, was a, that was a mic drop quote, Pauline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Uh-huh. One of the things I would love for you to talk about um, that you talk about in the book in, in terms of ways to kind of help people uh, come to terms with, with ambiguous loss is, is the importance of community. That This is a theme that I, I sense that comes up again. And almost in the way that I interpreted it was almost a return to um, uh, living through, through your tribe and, and, and working yeah. through things together. And you mentioned that there's a need for new rituals uh, for each small loss that that occurs along the way, I wondered if you could kind of talk about that and unpack that a little bit. What do you What do you necessarily mean by by rich, new rituals? Well, overall, we need new rituals for ambiguous loss, and some of them are on a community level, such as uh, the the villages that were hit with tsunami. Almost all the villages villagers washed away, um, and so on. Uh, in Japan, but we have those here too with mudslides and so on, Um, 9-11. There we need community uh, memorials, Um, perhaps not as fancy as the one in New York City, which is awesome, by the way, if you haven't seen it, Yeah. Uh, or the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., which is still uh, awesome to me. Um, what that does for family members is it says that we're not alone. The community is with us. The community recognizes that what we have lost somebody. Uh, that's very important. But it's also important on a smaller level. And by the way, these memorials community-wide don't have to be expensive. I encourage the villages in Japan to just have the children make something, gather together some stones or some, something that has um, meaning to that village. The important thing, though, is that each, whatever it is, has the name, the names of the missing people on it. It's the names you want. Mm. And that's where people go instead of having a grave to go to or an, and to know that other people recognize the loss. Now, let's go to a smaller version. Um, and that, let's take the example of Alzheimer's disease or some sort of dementia mm-hmm. where the person is gradually losing something. At first, a little bit of their memory and decision-making Later on, they may uh, lose their um, uh, ability to remember you. Later on, maybe incontinence. And later on, maybe not even being able to swallow. Uh, At each one of these, I encourage the family members to recognize the loss. and, And with something small, it might just be to light a candle with each other and saying, We've, we can't travel anymore together, that's gone. Or a woman in California told me she makes a, a paper, um, what are the Japanese uh, cuttings uh, with the scissors like birds? Oh, like uh, the uh, paper cranes? The paper cranes. She sends a paper crane out into the ocean each oh. time her husband lost another thing. And, of course, that's a plateau that goes down and down and down. Mm. And so I encourage grieving along the way and having one of, at least one other person with you when you do that. The ritual should not be done alone. It should have at least one witness mm. to comfort you uh, while you do it. So I do encourage people with dementia in the family to know that it's normal to be grieving along the way. It's not abnormal. It's not um, disloyal to be grieving before death has occurred. Hmm. I, I love that you brought that up because I actually had that that section um, in my notes. Uh, just the uniqueness of of uh, witnessing somebody going through something like Alzheimer's and 
Uh, mm-hmm. The point that you brought up that I wouldn't have even uh, wouldn't have even occurred to me is the fact that the caregiver in particular is is almost like grieving a thousand deaths, small deaths, over and over and over again. It's not just one. Yeah. You know. One. I think they would agree with you. Yes, I worked with so many. They often say that. But but what has um, and by the way, caregivers die at a rate sixty six percent higher than their same age group. So that's the current push to make life better for caregivers so that they don't die before the person they're taking care of. Um, One of their major stressors uh, has been um, isolation and nobody sharing this ongoing grief with them. That's why the rest of us need to go visit our neighbor who may be a caregiver. Our churches need to be more cognizant of what's going on with their caregivers and their isolation. Mm. The whole community needs, if we aren't caregiving ourselves, which many of us are, we need to uh, pay attention to the others and not have them socially isolated. Do you think, this is just off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm just thinking of, of why we like to, uh, not like to, but why oftentimes we avoid, or these, these caregivers get isolated, or these people that have suffered loss get isolated. And is it because at the end of the day, we all know that that loss that they suffered is something that we could suffer, and, and that's difficult for us to, to know what to do with? It's, we, you know, we like our illusions. Absolutely. We, li- we like our, right. our, our dreams and the fact that nothing bad is going to ever happen to us, and we're going to die, you know, like in the movie The Notebook, holding the hand of our uh-huh. husband or wife <laughs> yeah. at a ripe old age, yeah. and everything's going to be great. Holding hands in the same bed together. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, well, it's the randomness we don't like. Right. Um, it's the randomness. If it could happen to them, it could happen to me. Right. Um, you know, and of course I love that book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. That's Mm. Kushner's book is still number one on the list for me, uh, in helping families. Bad things do happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. So there you go. Um, we need a tolerance for ambiguity, and when I, over the years, as I've given uh, training talks on this, um, I was in New York once at the Jewish Community Center, and there were several theologians there, and one came up to me and said, when I say tolerance for ambiguity, he said, that's faith. <sighs> well, I hadn't thought of it that way, but it is, isn't it? Ah. Uh. That's so good. <laughs> that is so good. You're absolutely right. Um, to put a little bit of a, you know, not trying to put a positive spin on it, but there you do, uh, towards the end of your book, um, hit what I think was, again, just something that you don't think about, but it was so true, it rang so true, that because this is so difficult to talk about and it's so difficult to experience. But you say that ambiguous loss can, in spite of the high stress, produce some good in the confusion and lack of rigidity lie opportunities for creativity and new ways of being that have some purpose. That's a very important piece. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. New ways of being. In other words, for example, perfectionism is not the goal. Perfectionism is not what we should strive for. And, And a caveat, you know, my background is Swiss, uh, Swiss American, and so you know I got a heavy dose of it. Mm. Um, and um, they do make wonderful watches and precision instruments in Switzerland. I'm glad of that. Mm-hmm. But in human relationships, perfectionism does not work. It is not the thing we should strive for. Instead, we should strive for the tolerance for ambiguity Mm. because there always is ambiguity in a human relationship, ambiguity of absence and presence. Are they here for me or are they not? You never know 100%. Mm. You have faith. You have trust. uh, And and we need a little bit more um, faith in unanswered questions. And again, I want most of my questions answered. But there are some that are not answered. Uh, you, don't, you have people who are ill, they're suffering. With terminal illness, you know they're going to die, but you don't know when. And so this is in order to be with that person, in order to be the strongest human being you yourself can be, we have to be present for them 
even though we don't know what's going on. Hmm. This week's episode is brought to you by Dwell. Dwell is a Bible app that I absolutely love. Uh, If you're like me and you like to multitask, a lot of times I'm reading a book uh, on paper and then I've got one on my Kindle and then I'm also listening to audiobooks in the car. So if you're like me and you you like to optimize your time, then Dwell is the perfect app for you. Um, They've got tons of different recordings. You can pick your voice. Um, They've got all sorts of different uh, options uh, within the app and they have all the best versions of the Bible that you like. The ESV, the NIV, the KJV, the NLT, the Message, the BLT. That last one, I just made that up. BLTs, n- never mind, you get it. Anyway, uh, but you can listen, read along, and read. Uh, your time in Scripture can now be reinforced and enhanced as you explore all three modes. In fact, studies have shown that recall is significantly increased when listening and reading are combined, which is the way I like to do it if I can So check out the different listening plans. They even have a sleep timer, playlists, volume controls, uh, all sorts of uh, different options that you can utilize in there, including a make it your own section uh, as well. So to get started with Dwell, go to dwellapp.io slash deconstruct or visit the links in the show notes to get 10% off a yearly subscription or 30% off Dwell for life. 30% off means you save $60, so make sure to visit dwellapp.io slash deconstruct and commit to scripture for the rest of this year or for life. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. So... One of the things that I think is interesting uh, that you talk about in in terms of how to help people manage um, or or kind of come to terms with their their grieving process is you're careful to give guidelines and not prescriptions for resiliency and normalcy. Why why is that? Why is that an important distinction? Well, I think it's it would be a lot of hubris on my part if I gave <laughs> prescriptions. <laughs> That's just not my way. And if I'm talking about tolerance for ambiguity, and then I outline some specific prescriptions, that that would make me a hypocrite. Mm. <clears throat> yes, I do give guidelines, and I say guidelines on purpose, and they shouldn't be in linear fashion either. They can be used back and forth, or you can use some and not the others. Let me just list them. The first one is finding meaning, and the second is adjusting mastery. Mm. The third is reconstructing your identity, which changes when you have ambiguous loss. The next one is normalizing ambivalence, because ambivalence always follows ambiguity. Mm. And revising attachment, because you have to revise how you're attached to a person who is missing. And then finally, discovering new hope. You have to hope for something new and different because you can't have it the way you wanted it. So part of this is giving up our own need, our own ego for wanting things our way. It's with certain things, it just doesn't happen, um, like illness and like disappearance and like breaking up and so on. Um, these guidelines are, are used now um, worldwide in all different cultures, and we're finding that the guidelines and the theory of ambiguous loss holds up uh, in Eastern as well as Western cultures. Wow. Uh, there was one change. You may have caught it as I was reading the six guidelines. Instead of tempering mastery, I titled that, by the way, after 9-11, thinking of New Yorkers who are very can-do people. 
But when this was tested in East Timor and, and um, small villages by the International Red Cross uh, that were patriarchal villages and women's husbands were kidnapped, disappeared, they found that the women had no power. They were neither wife nor widow. And so they had to increase their mastery, not temper it, oh, wow. not tamp it down. So I have changed that word to adjusting mastery. That's the one correction thus far. And then adding a new hope, making sure people know I meant new hope uh, for the last one, not, find, not just hoping that things will go back to the way they were, because they don't. Uh, so you have to find something new to hope for. Mm. To orient your direction. Yep. Yeah. You have to you have to see yourself in a new way. You know, am I still a wife if my husband has Alzheimer's disease and doesn't know me anymore? Um, I, I remember this with my mother. Uh, I was taking care of my mother, and um, and so I needed to take care of her. But every now and then, she would look at me and say, "I'm still your mother." <laughs> Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, we had a sense of humor about it, and we could laugh. But it was um, my role was unclear, ambiguous at the time, because uh, ordinarily she was my mother, I was her daughter. She took care of me, but now I was taking care of her, and things were topsy-turvy. Uh, so your identity changes there, too. You become both a daughter and a parent to your parent. Hmm. in cases like that. So that's... that's I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was saying I thought about each of these guidelines. Oh, I wanted to say this one thing. So, mm-hmm. the, so they're definitely guidelines. I'm happy I said guidelines so that people from different cultures uh, around the world can plug in their ambiguous losses, and that seems to be working now. Mm. Uh, in other words, the loose guidelines are better than a prescription because the minute we, and I'm a white person with a European background in a Western culture, the minute we give a prescription, it, it, it's arrogant. It mm. doesn't fit the rest of the world. Yeah, we love doing it, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, love yeah. doing it. Yep, we, we have been doing it. We might be a little bit arrogant, I think. I learn a great deal from the Native Americans here in Duluth, Minnesota, and and also in Montreal and so on, uh, about not doing that. Mm. Um, and so it takes a little bit of a shift in your thinking as mm. to... to Stay with a looser model that is more inclusive and more general uh, rather than getting specific. So I'm very happy not to get specific. Hmm. So much here. This is such a, such a fun conversation. Uh, I want to take a, a little bit of a pivot turn here. One of the things that I noticed uh, in reading your works and listening to your interviews and hearing you talk about this, even the subject we were just talking about, all the different changes that need to happen and uh, how our mastery needs to be adjusted and things like that because there's so many different things going on, uh, identity shifts and, and things of that layer. You know, yep. the, the ambiguity itself is multi-layered. You know, there's, That's right. There's a lot to it. It's not just one thing. It's not like, oh, I'm just trying to get used to this person not being here and figuring out what that means. There's, there's a, it's like a nerve center, and it goes uh-huh. off to a whole bunch of different things. One of the things that we're interested in on this podcast is, you know, while your work deals a lot with the death or disappearance of a loved one specifically, uh, we'd also like to just talk a little bit about how that plays into our relationship with the sacred or the divine or God, many of us, because of the loss or disappearance of a loved one or some other trauma, experience also what seems to be the loss or disappearance of our faith or our God or things like that. And I would mm. love, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. That's interesting. I, I heard from families about that after 9-11. <clears throat> when people in the family or sometimes um, professionals would say to them, it was God's will that your loved one was in the building at the time and now they've disappeared in the ground zero. Mm. 
what a terrible thing to say to people because uh, yeah. what happened was many of them said to uh, I heard them say actually, if it's God's will, then I'm done with God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so there has to be another way to say it, uh, and um, I, I I know there are other ways to say it, but I know a lot of people say it that way, and maybe in I'm not a theologian, so. Uh, I may be saying this wrong, but psychologically, it isn't helpful to people to say it that way. Mm -mm. Uh, It may turn them, and especially the young people, the adolescents and the kids, immediately would say, well, then I don't like God. Mm -hmm. Mm. So much of what we've uh, found on this show is that there's this upheaval right now. There's a lot, and you know, it happens from time to time all throughout history. There's people have documented this, but... Uh, John and I feel like we're participating now in a conversation where we're we're reestablishing some of the things, and and so much of your language applies to what we've talked about so much on the podcast. Even the whole idea of adjusting our mastery. So much of what we experience in this in this realm, where people are saying, you know, I used to relate to the divine or to my faith community in this way. And now that's not there anymore for whatever reason. It could be because of something uh, a little bit more acute, like an actual trauma, like nine 11 or, you know, a death in the family or, you know, some ambiguous loss that then, you know, becomes that nerve center that eventually gets you to ambiguity with the divine or with God. But, that language of mastery, we find that so many of us want so desperately to have our concepts of God completely figured out. And when something happens that upsets that or disturbs it, you know, we're, we're sent, right. we're sent, re- right. we're sent reeling. And then we have to, I just yeah. think we have to take a looser grip. It, it, sometimes it feels to me like, um, if it doesn't go our way, then we drop out. Yeah. Um, you know, if the congregation hires the wrong minister, we drop out. Um, if if it doesn't go our way, if the minister isn't doing it the way we think he or she should do it, we drop out. Well, those are mastery-oriented um, reactions, I think. Um, one needs to have take a looser grip, be a little more flexible about tolerating differences, tolerating things that change over time. I mean, my gosh... Uh, how things have changed over time regarding diversity and so on. Mm. And uh, if we just take a closer look at it, uh, if we can stand what we don't know about for a little bit longer, we can find something exciting in it. Mm. Uh, we we get stronger because of it. It's, it's, again, a paradox. The more you can tolerate the ambiguity, um, the stronger you are. Mm. I, I would just love to follow this line of thought um, because like, like Adam said, I, I feel like so much of what you're saying um, I, I really identify with um, from, from my particular perspective. And one of the things that I thought was fascinating was where you talk about uh, the importance of changing or tweaking rituals versus canceling them. And the first thing I thought of was uh, we have a lot of listeners who reach out to us who say, you know, like I've been, I've been hurt by the church and I just can't go to church anymore or whatever the case may be. And the first piece of advice we always give them is community is so important. So maybe, maybe instead of that ritual going to a ch- church right now, maybe you just meet with, with friends at a coffee shop, but you maintain that sense Absolutely. of community and support. It's community. You know, we're, we're an, we're becoming an isolated society and that scares me. Yes. Um, you know, we can Twitter and we can do all these other things, but really we're home alone doing this. Mm, right. And community is the way for people to recognize that we have commonalities and differences that we can help each other. If we don't, if we don't get more into community, the tribe again, the human race is in danger. Mm. Um, you know, it was the tribal system that allowed it to, to survive and evolve. Um, and we're, we may be evolving in the wrong direction now. It's possible. Agreed. Yeah, it's absolutely possible. Um, the, one of the things, again, another, I, I see. Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 please. I see a lot of community here, uh, in, in the Midwest, of course, but then people may move around less here. So yeah. I don't know how it is on the coast, but, um, 
we can't keep up with all there is to do with the community. Of course, there are the sports sports fans, but there's music here, there's theater here, uh, there are uh, uh, community organizations to help uh, the children and immigrant communities, and so on. There's there's just stuff all over here, in um, in any kind of field that you're interested in. So uh, there's really no one could go without. Um, and I just love that about the Twin Cities. I think they're very good at that. Mm, that's great. Yeah, we, John and I feel the same way about Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, definitely. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, maybe a Midwestern thing yeah. uh, more than the coast, primarily because, uh, you know, there are families that don't move around that much. Yeah. And uh, once, once professionals come, they seem to stay. And uh, that that allows community. Oh, we have lots of bicycle communities here too. So mm. there's all that. So, yes, community is essential. Yes. And um, if you can't, if if somebody turns on their church, you know, they could look for another one, or they could, as you say, go to a coffee shop and be with other people, get to know somebody, get to help somebody. For God's sakes, there are people who need help. Yes. Yeah, that's so good. Um, another, another word that I just scribbled down as we were talking through all this, and it's something that I, I had realized multiple times uh, looking at your work and it's another commonality between what you do mainly with relationships and families and what John and I witness a lot talking to people, uh, in and around this podcast project. And it's this idea of, uh, mystery and how, you know, uh-huh. as, as humans, uh, we're very ill-equipped to deal with the mystery in relationships. You mentioned that. And one of the things that John and I have noticed is uh, most of what people get um, upset or disturbed at is when, you know, they wake up to find God is the great other. You know, the, you know this, this concept that they can't control. And, and, mm-hmm. and they're very uncomfortable with the fact that, you know, it might not be exactly as they thought it was. And it creates this upheaval. Um, in their faith. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about um, how you see a, you know, a, a comfort with mystery as being something that's helpful in, in relationships and, and possibly then, then we could extrapolate that over to faith. Oh, I, th- I just think we all need to be more comfortable with mystery. Um, and I read somewhere somebody in Tibet said it's ego wanting its own way if you think we're going to have no suffering in life. Mm. Uh, things don't just, things will go our way hopefully most of the time, but it's rare that they will go our way all the time. And so there will be mysteries in our life, uh, and God may be one of them. Um, religion may be one of them. Uh, there may be others as well. And I, I would just say make your peace with it. Um, we need a higher tolerance for ambiguity in this culture particularly. Um, other cultures have more of it than we do. Uh, I can say that. And it's probably because, you know, we cleared the plains and we straightened the rivers. Mm. We put a man on the moon. All good things. But we need to know that we also have to increase our tolerance for the mystery. Um, sometimes there are surprises in a mystery yeah, you don't get your own way, but maybe you learn something new. And what I've heard mostly yes. from the people I've done therapy with over 40 years and worked with is that they feel stronger for being able to tolerate the mystery. Yes. They feel as if they've grown deeper. And I agree. Uh. I think it is a sign of mental health to be able to tolerate mystery. Uh, to want things to be perfect all the time, to have answers all the time, is a lesser level of maturity psychologically. Mm. Oh, preach it, Pauline. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> no, so so much so, of this. So we all have to try, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, oh, so many things come to mind when you start saying those things. You know, we, we have been trying to introduce so many people to people like Father Richard Rohr and the contemplative mind. And, you know, mm-hmm. at the end That's of your... That's what it is, probably. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's the contemplative mind, yeah. and uh, yeah. which is right in the stream uh, that we need it to be in as far as, you know, uh, our relationship to the divine and community and all those kinds of things. It's everything we're talking about. Right at the end of your book, you, you drop so many things from referencing um, poets like 
uh, Keats and his negative capability. Yes. To uh-huh. Al- oh, that quote from Alice Walker, expect nothing and live frugally on surprise. To, uh-huh. to uh, the phrase that you say, you say ambigu- ambiguity does not have to devastate. I'm wondering. Does not. No, it doesn't. It does not. So this is so important. Uh, if you could just give us some guidelines, not prescription, but guidelines. Um, my last question, and then I think John has one more. How can we start to foster uh, that comfort with ambiguous loss day to day? How can we start to be more comfortable with mystery? What does that mean? Well, the psychiatrist I studied with at Wisconsin, Whitaker, um, after he died, the grandchildren were speaking at his funeral, and they said the favorite thing their, the grandfather did was if he would invite them one by one, one at a time, into the car, and he would say, let's go get lost. Um, I have tried that with my grandchildren, and now today my husband and I still do it on a Sunday. We'll just get in the car and say, let's go and get lost. Uh, it's a wonderful adventure. Uh, no map. Um, you need a full gas tank. Um, <laughs> but you meander. And also, can your organization have a meeting without an agenda? Can you go somewhere just to uh, wander on a path? You don't quite know where it's going. So these are exercises that I think we all who are mastery-oriented have to do. So Can you take a trail you've never taken before? Can you go down the rapids uh, where you don't have control of the water all the time? There are, oh, and here's one I think, and it may be why fishermen are quite mellow people. I think going fishing is an exercise in increasing your tolerance for ambiguity. Wow. You never know if you're going to catch a fish or not. And, you know, true fishermen go fishing anyhow. They seem to love it, and I, so I'm I'm um, I'm putting them on a pedestal for having a high tolerance for ambiguity. So we have to practice it, is what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, consciously, we have to be mindful of shifting from being so problem oriented, um, answer oriented, to having a tolerance for unanswered questions and the mystery of it all. Man, when when I hear you say that, when I oh. when I hear you ask that question, you know, can can you let go a little? So I keep good. hearing, can you live life? Yes. Can you li- Can yeah. you really yeah. live? Some some people can't let go. They want to know certainty about everything that's going to happen, and you know, you can't always give it. Oh, that's so, amazing. So good. Uh, before we quit, I wanted to um, tell you the name of. Uh, You mentioned Ambiguous Loss, which was the first book I wrote on this topic, and Mm -hmm. it certainly is the bestseller. Um, But if people want to go um, into what do you do about it, they may like the My Norton book, Lost Trauma and Resilience. Mm. Um, It's uh, therapeutic work with ambiguous loss, and non-therapists read it, too. Oh, great. Um, They say it's accessible enough. And then if there's somebody who is a caregiver, they might like loving someone who has dementia, okay. which I wrote for families themselves. That's perfect. Fantastic. Well, I just, I, we have one more question for you before we let you go. Okay. Um, and and okay. I, I think this, this would be a perfect way to, for us to end our time together. Um, we have a lot of listeners who, who tune in to listen to our podcast for whatever unknown reason. <laughs> uh, we just feel fortunate, but... <laughs> They come from a, a multitude of different backgrounds, uh, ethnicities, uh, even religions. Like we're, we're very uh-huh. proud of the fact that we have a very diverse group of people, and and I think that a lot of people, I think pretty much anybody listening to our podcast can identify with with one of the types of ambiguous loss that you name in your book. I mean, you talk about loss of a job, mm-hmm. loss of a friendship, a home. Um, you know, especially for people who have who have suffered through these hurricanes we've had having lately. And of course, at the time of this recording, the wildfire fires, excuse me, out in uh, California, Um, you know, addiction, divorce, sense of safety. Um, And a lot of people, of course, who listen to our show, um, the loss of, of uh, their sense of religious upbringing, or maybe their inherited idea of God. Um, I wonder Uh if you you could just leave um, our listeners with maybe some words of hope. Word of hope for all of these people? Yeah. <laughs> Small task, well, I know. Yeah, you know, I'm struggling too. Um, I, I would not uh, 
I, I don't want to have a hierarchy with the people who are listening to this podcast. Mm. I want to say we're all in this together. Amen. Yes. Uh, and so the struggle, I would say just start the struggle. Just go on to start the journey and go on it. Uh, and you will find that even if you've lost something so dear to your heart, uh, while you will grieve, and you should, know that you don't have to get over the sadness about it. But at the same time, you need to move forward with your life in a different way without that thing that you've lost. Uh, and it's possible to do that. Um, it takes a little, um, how can I say, trust in the unknown to do that. Um, my mother was a Calvinist, of course. Um, most people in Switzerland, um, many people in Switzerland are. And so she always said, um, you know, you need to, you need to uh, get the work done. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, God helps those who help themselves. So I was trained to work hard. And then, of course, the church I belong to is the United Church of Christ, which is a very liberal um, church um, uh, in its interpretation of things. But it has a high uh, emphasis on do the work, social social involvement, which again fits with my mother's view. Hmm. So I think you just have to start start the work. Just do it. Hmm. Just do it. I guess that's Nike, isn't it? <laughs> no, I love that so much. <laughs> Oh, it, you knocked it out of the park just now. I just want you to know that. <laughs> okay. Easy, well, easy question, you. but you, 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 you mastered that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pauline, this has been such a joy. This could only be better if we were all sitting down in some cozy little nook drinking coffee or tea I, or something. I would like that. I would like that. Perhaps another time if yeah. I get to Columbus or if you get to Minneapolis. Oh, Absolutely. Well, we will totally do that. Before we let you go, um, obviously you have a couple books out um, that that we can't recommend highly enough. We thoroughly enjoyed, uh, you know, a, a lot of your writing. I found even more online. And uh, uh, where can people go to find your works, and how can they stay on top of what you're up to? Oh, the website would be the best place: mm. www.ambiguousloss.com. Mm. Perfect. Done. Well, thank you so much for spending uh, some time with us this evening, and uh, we would love to have you back when you get done with that new book. Um, I, I think this is such an applicable uh, subject matter for, for everyone, so oh, thank you for the work you're this, doing. Your work is so incredibly important in this day and age, and I just uh, we're so honored to have you with us. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, and uh, greetings to all of your readers and listeners. Uh, you're doing a good thing here. Thank Good you. Thing. Thank, Thank you. you so much, All Pauline. Right. Well, take care. Bye. Grace and peace to you.
Take up your cross, use it to build a wall, and reach across the aisle and fire your guns so you can keep them. And love, love how you want, if we approve. And you. Salvation from sinners. I won't do it anymore. It's taken me too long to recover. I go feed the sick and poor and try to help them. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com.